Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to today's virtual learning community on medication assisted treatment and drug court. This is the first in a three part series that's presented by the Gaines Center for Behavioral Health and Justice Transformation with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Today's webinar is entitled Medication Assisted Treatment and Drug Courts, Virtual Learning Communities, Addressing the Concerns of Court Staff About Medication Assisted Treatment. And we're just going to give folks just one more minute to sign on. We see people are signing on very quickly and we know that there's sometimes a little bit of a lag time as you're connecting with the audio. So we'll just allow people a minute or so to sign on. So hello again, as people are continuing to sign on, I'm just gonna take care of some housekeeping uh, items. And the three presenters who I am going to introduce in greater detail in a few minutes are Dr. Lawrence Westreich, the Honorable William Meyer, and Mr. Andrew Brown. Uh, following the webinar, the presenters will join us in participating in an hour long discussion to answer any questions that you have and that we are not able to get to during the webinar itself. Uh, I am Maureen McLeod. I'm a senior research associate with the Gaines Center at Policy Research Associates, and I am going to be serving as your moderator today. So before we begin the presentations, as I mentioned, I have a few housekeeping items to review with you. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. During the webinar, if you have any questions for the presenters, or if you have any questions in regards to the technology itself, we ask that you please type them into the Q&A pod on the right side of your screen, and we will address as many of your questions for the presenters as time permits, either at the end of the webinar and during the scheduled discussion group. Uh, we will also be conducting a brief poll. We appreciate your participation in advance. When you see the poll appear on your screen, uh, please enter your responses. Uh, in fact, there it is, the poll has arrived. This webinar is being recorded. The slides will be disseminated via the GAINS listserv following the webinar. All registered participants will be notified via email when the webinar recording is posted to the SAMHSA's YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be available for download at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, please note that the certificate is for personal portfolio use only and is not to be used for CEU credits. There will be ASL interpretation for this event. To view the ASL interpretation, uh, here are some procedural steps. Go to layout in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Select hide non-video participants. Then change the layout view to full screen. And then finally select view all. Uh, this icon looks a little bit like opposing edges of a, of a rectangle. Uh, the interpretation services are being provided today by Katie Lambie and Michelle Johnson. So thank you, Katie and Michelle. There's also live captioning for this event. To view the live captioning, 
select the accept button in the multimedia pod, which is located in the lower right hand corner of your WebEx screen. The color contrast of the live caption pod can be modified as needed. We recommend high contrast style for the best, uh, the best visibility. I want to just take a moment to introduce you to today's webinar agenda. In a few moments, Dr. John Berg will provide a welcome from SAMHSA. Uh, presentations from Dr. Westreich, Judge Meyer, and Andy Brown will follow. So at this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to Dr. John Berg, who's a senior public health advisor at SAMHSA, and he will provide some opening remarks. So John, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. McLeod, um, and thank you for the um, promotion to doctor. I am not a doctor, but that sounded, sounded nice. <laughs> so welcome <laughs> to the virtual learning community, um, Medication Assisted Treatment and Drug Course, Part 1, addressing the concerns of court staff about MAT. And we're very excited about today's uh, VLC and appreciate you taking time to participate. SAMHSA is interested in promoting policies and practices to lower the risk of overdose for persons with opioid use disorder who are or have been in contact with the criminal justice system. <clears throat> there is overwhelming evidence that MAT is an effective intervention for addressing opioid use disorders in the criminal justice populations. Research indicates current high rates of opioid use disorder among drug court participants nationally, but there are gaps in the availability of medication assisted treatment in many drug court programs. Despite the documented efficacy of medication-assisted treatment and its designation as the gold standard in the treatment of opioid use disorders, resistance among court officials and treatment providers has resulted in underutilization of this treatment option in some jurisdictions. For many years, SAMHSA has encouraged SAMHSA-funded drug courts to provide MAT and required that they will not deny access to drug court programs to any eligible client for his or her use of FDA approved medications for SUD treatment. Since fiscal year 20, SAMHSA is requiring drug courts to implement medication assisted treatment with access to FDA approved medications. Therefore, if drug courts are interested in future SAMHSA funding, attending this VLC will be very helpful with effective implementation of MAT. SAMHSA released an evidence-based resource guide in 2019 titled Use of Medication-Assisted Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder in Criminal Justice Settings. This guide focuses on using medication-assisted treatment for op opioid use disorder in jails and prisons and during the reentry process when justice-involved persons return to the community. It provides an overview of policies and evidence-based practices that reduce the risk of overdose and relapse. This document is provided today as a resource and can be found on the SAMHSA website. Today's webinar will identify barriers to MAT acceptance by prosecution and defense attorneys, judges, case managers, and treatment providers, and other members of the treatment court team, and will outline several approaches for addressing these common concerns about MAT. A site-specific strategy to overcome MAT resistance will be presented. We're excited to host today's VLC as we have three experts in the criminal justice field, Dr. Westreich, the Honorable William Meyer and Andrew Brown, Program Coordinator for SAMHSA Funded Drug Court. I would also like to thank the Gaines Center and their staff for their work in developing and facilitating this virtual learning community and today's session. At this time, I will turn it doc back to Dr. McLeod. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our three speakers for today, starting with Dr. Lawrence Westreich, a graduate of the University of Minnesota School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Westreich uh, completed an internship in internal medicine at the Hennepin County Minnesota Medical Center, a residency in psychiatry at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City, and a two-year fellowship in addiction psychiatry at NYU Bellevue Hospital. He's board certified in general psychiatry, addiction psychiatry, and forensic psychiatry. Dr. Westreich is an associate professor of clinical psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at New York University of Medicine and the author of Helping the Addict You Love and A Parent's Guide to Teen Addiction. In his professional practice, 
Dr. Westreich treats individuals with addictions and dual diagnoses and serves as a consultant in forensic matters, especially drug testing, child custody disputes, and disability. Dr. Westreich is a past president of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry and serves as consultant on behavioral health and addiction to the commissioner of Major League Baseball. The Honorable William Meyer was a general jurisdiction judge from 1984 to 2000 in Denver, Colorado and was co-founder and first presiding judge of the Denver Drug Court, which began operations in 1993. In 2000, after he retired from the bench, he joined Judicial Arbiter Group, a meditation arbitration firm. Judge Meyer serves as the Senior Judicial Fellow for the National Drug Court Institute and provides training and curriculum development for over 3,700 drug courts. He chaired the committee that wrote the Bureau of Justice Assistance's Drug Court Key Components in 1997. He's an alumnus of the National Judicial College and is on the Judicial College's Wall of Honor. In 2017, he received the NADCP Stanley Goldstein Award for preeminent service to the drug court field. Judge Meyer is the author of Federal Sentencing Reporter's Drug Courts Work, 2002, and Colorado Rules of Evidence with Objections in 2020. He's a contributing author and co-editor of the National Drug Court Institute's Drug Court Judicial Bench Book, and recently published an article in the Journal for Advancing Justice, analyzing cases involving access to MAT and drug-free conditions of probation. Judge Meyer established and maintains a national webliography of case law on constitutional and other legal issues arising in the drug court field. Andrew Brown is the program coordinator for the Ottawa County Recovery Court that's located in Western Michigan. He served in this position for 10 years. Mr. Brown holds master's degrees in public administration and social work and is a graduate of the National Center for State Courts Fellows Program. His recovery court is currently recognized as one of eight, um, oh boy, eight national mentor courts in the United States by the NADCP. And I see that we have our polling responses that have come up. And this is actually kind of surprising when we look at where uh, our registrants have come from that were fairly equally divided between rural, suburban, and urban jurisdictions, which really tells us that this is an issue of importance to everybody around the country. In terms of the affiliation, we have, it looks like a fairly even number of participants from the judiciary and from probation and parole, and from government and community-based organizations. So we want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I am going to turn the presenter ball over to our first presenter, uh, Dr. Larry Westreich. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. McLeod and Mr. Berg for your kind invitation to speak today. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking with uh, before uh, Judge Meyer and, and Andrew uh, Brown regarding the medication assisted treatment, specifically in the justice system. Um, this is a matter that's near and dear to my heart, and uh, I'm sure it's near and dear to your hearts too, to all the listeners. Um, I wanted to say that the, the questions I received before um, this seminar from each of you pointed me towards where I think we need to be today. Uh, I'm going to lay the groundwork for the medical aspects of medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorders. Um, and my colleagues will then move forward with how it's actually implemented in the legal system within prisons and jails and also in, in the civil uh, justice system. So, um. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a lot of things pretty quickly. So um, I want you to know that there is a list of references at the back. So everything that I cite will be there. Um, if you want to look into the data sets that I talk about, uh, please go to the, to the references that I will have at the back. So if you're going to have some take home points for today, here's what mine would be. Um, 
There are three FDA approved medications uh, for opioid use disorders. Those are buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone. It's quite clear the use of MAT, that's all those medications, prevents opioid overdose deaths. But in addition, use of MAT improves treatment retention. It suppresses illicit opioid use and allows a person with an addiction to return to their life. Um, I'm going to advocate for the view that use of MAT in the justice system is both appropriate and helpful to the patients receiving it and often life saving. Um, my whole talk is essentially going to be elaborating on uh, what uh, Mr. Berg said earlier that although it's quite clear that this is the gold standard for treatment of opioid use disorders, there are gaps in our, our delivery of this life saving treatment, both outside of the justice system, but in the justice system also. Um, so, first of all, what's addiction? Um, and this is um, from the, the DSM, the, the uh, Psychiatric uh, Book of Nosology. It's a substance use disorder which describes a problematic pattern of using alcohol or another substance that results in impairment in daily life or noticeable distress. A person with this disorder will often continue to use a substance despite the consequences. So this encapsulates it in academic terms pretty well. There's much more to it, but this is the idea. They're being impaired in their daily life and they have noticeable distress and they continue to use despite consequences. So when the family says, oh, it just doesn't make sense he keeps using cocaine or he's a smart guy, why does he keep doing this? That's the point. Here's a different definition, which I like also. Let's see here. If it, it's an addiction, if the substance use affects a person's ability to live, laugh, love, and learn. So this is a good thumbnail for you. Um, if you're thinking about how to define whether someone's got an addiction or just misuse of a substance. So let's talk about stigma. And so, you know, a majority of the questions that I got before we started were about uh, stigma attached to the substance use disorders. And so from the get go, when we're working with people with substance use disorders, we want to uh, avoid stigmatizing language and certainly stigmatizing thinking in our uh, in our work with the addicted person. Um, so stigmatizing words are addict or abuser. A non-stigmatizing phrase would be something like a person with a substance use disorder or a person with addiction. Now you'll notice out of the gate that I said addict is stigmatizing, but I've used it a couple of times. In fact, at the beginning, there were a couple of notations in my biblio in my biography and my bibliography about use of that term. There are gray areas here, and I think this, this is a good place for discussion at some points. Um, there's no gray area about terms like dirty urine, though. We wouldn't say that someone's uh, blood sugar test for uh, diabetes is dirty if they have a high glucose. We don't use that term. We say it's, it's positive for opioids. We don't use clean or dirty. We say the person's in recovery if they're not using substances. Um, for the matter we're talking about today, um, we don't use the term substitution therapy. We use a, a term like medication assisted treatment or medications for opioid use disorder or a number of other terms. Um, we don't, you know, in the justice world, actually, you do say the person's a recidivist, but in the uh, clinical world, we say a person who has returned to use of the substances. Um, and, you know, if you're looking for the best language to, to use, I would refer to the DSM because they're there is since 2013 um, probably a near state of the art uh, language about uh, uh, how we just describe the, the substance use disorders. This slide is only meant to show you that there's been quite an increase in fatal drug overdoses, tracking the over, uh, opioid uses and, and of other drug use uh, since the COVID pandemic has started. And I think it goes without saying that the uh, trauma that uh, people with substance use disorders are facing is promoting the use of substances over the last 12 to 14 months. Um, I don't get, probably don't need to show you graphs to tell you that. Um, I want to talk for a second about psychosocial approaches to addiction. There are well-documented manualized treatments for the treatment of substance use disorders. Um, there are uh, peer support groups like Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, Ones I use are uh, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, contingency management strategies. All of those things are perfectly valid approaches to the use to the treatment of substance use disorders, but they're not what I'm talking about. And, and I, I say that just to say that I'm not someone who just believes only in medication, uh, but I believe in medication use and the use of psychosocial treatments. So, 
I always talk about what a physician should think about when he or she is considering medication for the use of a for the treatment of a substance use disorder. Um, one has to think about any additional medical illness and the patient's ability to tolerate the medication. Uh, one has to evaluate if the patient is pregnant. Um, so you know uh, the treatment for a pregnant woman who is on maintenance medication for treatment of an opioid use disorder like buprenorphine or methadone is to continue that treatment throughout the pregnancy. And the reason is um, that the likelihood of relapse to uh, heroin and to injectable heroin is very, very high, and that is certainly damaging to or potentially damaging to a fetus. Um, one also needs to think about the phase of recovery that the person is in as to know what kind of medication would be most useful to that individual. There are three medications for opioid dependence. Those are methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. I'm going to talk about each one. Uh, the brand names, methadone, no one uses the, word, the name dolophine, but that is the brand name for it. Uh, buprenorphine is in various pre preparations, including suboxone, which has an opioid antagonist, subutex, which does not, sublocade, which is the injection, and buprenex, another medication. Um, naltrexone it, it is available in pill form or it's available in a 28-day injection. And I'm going to talk about each one of these medications specifically right now. Before I get to that, though, I want to talk to you about the difference between uh, naloxone and naltrexone. Naloxone is what uh, EMTs and often police officers carry in their belt. It immediately reverses an opioid overdose, uh, but the, it only lasts in the body for 20 to 30 minutes. So it's not a long-term solution, but it's a short-term solution if someone has an overdose and it will re revive the person immediately. So let me talk about what agonist therapy is. Um, that is the use of a long-acting medication in the same class as the drug that contributed to the SUD. Now, if someone takes uh, either methadone or buprenorphine, they won't have withdrawal, uh, withdrawal syndrome, uh, but tolerance will be induced. So what that means is that if someone takes this medication, they shouldn't feel any uh, withdrawal from opioids. Uh, they will become tolerant, and so they, if they stop the medication, they'll withdraw. Um, so that's the bottom line of what agonists are, and those, the agonists I'm talking about are methadone and buprenorphine. What it's not is substitution of one addiction for another. And I'm very careful in language here, and as I explained to you at the beginning, when someone has an addiction, their ability to function in the world, in their work or their school or their relationships is impaired. When they're on a uh, medication that is not addicting, their ability to perform in their relationships, in their work, in their school, and their everyday functioning is actually improved. So that is the difference. Let me talk about methadone, and I'm going to be very careful with each medication I talk about to tell you about the benefits and about the downsides. And that should be the model for the education we do about these medications. Uh, if we're going to be realistic with our patients and their families and larger systems, we have to talk about both. So it's quite clear that methadone causes a person to be able to stabilize their lifestyle if they have an opioid use disorder. It's quite clear that people have improved health and nutritional status. There is a decrease in criminal behavior, and there's an increase in employment, and there's a decrease in injection, drug use, and shared needles. Now, I want you to note that I am not saying that methadone or any of these medications is a panacea and it cures everything. Um, it is helpful, and there's a decrease in criminal behavior. There's an improvement in overall health, uh, but it's hardly a cure-all. What are the downsides of methadone? Uh, overdose is possible. Someone who is not tolerant to methadone, like a family member or a child who gets it, could certainly overdose. People can become over-sedated. That usually happens when someone is taking another medication. Withdrawal will occur if someone stops abruptly their use of methadone. Um, there is a potential for EKG changes for cardiograms, and methadone can and sometimes is diverted to uh, be sold. Let me talk about buprenorphine. Um, the difference between buprenorphine and methadone, at least procedurally, is that a doctor can prescribe who has a special license. It doesn't have to be a federally sanctioned clinic or a hospital. There's a clear lifestyle stabilization that, that occurs for a person with opioid use disorder. Um, withdrawal is less severe than, than methadone, but it's a little longer. Uh, a, do, a patient can see a doctor for treatment of his or her opioid use disorder, as well as other medical illnesses. Downsides are person certainly has withdrawal. Um, there may be diversion of 
of buprenorphine, less likely than methadone, but it is possible. Uh, and also, as with methadone, you know, there's a meaning to maintenance treatment, and uh, that that emotional uh, aspect can't can't and shouldn't be ignored. The third medication I'm going to talk to you about is intramuscul intramuscular naltrexone. It's Vivitrol, and that's the opposite of the first two. The first two are agonists; they hit the receptor. This is a blocker. It's an antagonist, so it blocks any use of opioids. So benefits are if someone takes this medication, they won't have any withdrawal. Um, there's no diversion of this medication. It doesn't get anybody high. Uh, it prevents impulsive use of an opioid. Uh, there is certainly lifetime lifestyle stabilization that takes place, and it can be prescribed in any doctor's office. Uh, what are the downsides of uh, naltrexone? Uh, you need to have an injection every month. Again, there's a meaning of maintenance uh, treatment. Uh, unfortunately, after people stop naltrexone, there's a 90% return to substance use uh, disorders. Uh, there's uh, some liver side effects. Uh, one of the major things to me, in addition to the uh, need for a, a injection every month, is that there's a lack of compliance. Patients seem to uh, stick with uh, naltrexone much less than they do with the first two I mentioned to you. Um, so, what are decision making about the prescription of MAT? And from your questions, I think this is probably going to be where we're talking in the discussion. But um, there are some clinical thoughts and then some administrative aspects of thinking about having MAT in a program. For an individual, we look at their prior response to medications, we look at the side effect profile. We must look as a clinician at the occupation, the potential for drug testing. If the person is going to be tested for buprenorphine, for instance, um, and that will affect his ability to work in his or her occupation, uh, we need to think about that. Um, what's the meaning of physical dependence and also patient preference? Uh, in these matters, uh, engaging with the patient and building an alliance with him or her, and then deciding on a medication as a mutual decision rather than an edict from the doctor is what has to be done. Um, administratively, um, obviously, there has to be availability uh, within the treating area. There has to be availability after discharge from a treatment program. If someone's in a jail situation, is able to get the medication, but then leaves and is unable to get it, that probably would not be a good choice. Um, and you have to think about cost to the patient if that's an issue after leaving the facility. And then there is a stigma attached to some medications. And this is where one has. Uh, discussions uh, with uh, administrators and uh, decision makers about what is best within a program and looks at uh, the, the inaccurate beliefs they may have sometimes. Um, I want to show you a few trial. These are a few research papers, which I cite in the back. This is a large meta-analysis of 31 trials with more than 5,000 participants. It was clear that buprenorphine was much superior to placebo for retention and treatment. Um, buprenorphine at higher than the at the average dose and higher suppressed opioid use to, use um, methadone appeared to be superior to buprenorphine for treatment and retention, uh, but they both suppress illicit opioid use. The mortality risk during and after MAT is quite clear. This is looking at uh, more than 120,000 participants in methadone treatment. There was 11.3 out of a thousand mortality rate. Out of methadone treatment, it was triple that. And, and this is certainly the finding of every study I've ever seen. It's certainly been my clinical experience also. Um, the opioid um, medications that I'm telling you about are certainly the standard of care for this exact reason. So the take home points uh, I have for you today um, are that there are three FDA approved medications for MAT for treatment of opioid use disorder. Those are buprenorphine and methadone and naltrexone. There is no question that use of MAT prevents opioid overdose deaths, and MAT improves treatment retention, suppresses illicit opioid use, and allows the person with an addiction to return to his or her life. Um, use of MAT in the justice system is absolutely appropriate, and it's what uh, Judge Meyer and Andrew are going to be talking about uh, in the next session. So um, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions, and I will uh, turn things over to uh, Judge Meyer right now. field for 
uh, 27 years since um, 1993. And I've always thought that the drug court field and drug courts were really strongly tied to um, science-based treatment, uh, best practices. So to my uh, much surprise, a uh, study came out in two 2013 um, by Dr. Harlan um, Matsusau uh, that revealed that over 44% of all drug courts don't use any type of medication assistance treatment uh, as part of their quivers in addressing uh, substance abuse issues uh, in their programs. And of the 56% of drug courts that did use such treatment, um, there were clearly certain biases toward one type of medication-assisted treatment or another. And what Matusau and his colleagues uh, determined was uh, in many courts, there is a drug court policy uh, established by the drug, drug court judge that has a blanket prohibition against uh, medication-assisted treatment. And in many drug courts, treatment providers not, do not recommend uh, medication-assisted treatment, uh, particularly uh, the use of methadone, and then secondarily, uh, the use of buprenorphine. Um, one of the reasons that it's not recommended is uh, that the drug courts believe that there is a high risk of diversion, and certainly there is a risk of diversion, uh, but it can be addressed appropriately, and we'll talk about that. Um, certainly a lack of local providers in particularly rural areas is one reason that medication-assisted treatment is unavailable, as is insufficient funding. Um, so what I'd like to do is I would like to discuss with you um, the perceptions of the, the drug court team, who they listen to, and their perceptions of what um, the experts uh, tell the field and what is supported in the field, and then uh, things that um, could and should uh, change their team's reluctance to look at medication-assisted treatment as part of the alternatives of treatment available for opiate use disorders. And then finally, kind of a, a glide path into adopting medication-assisted treatment as part of the program. So let's talk about what does the team think and who do we listen to? Not surprisingly, um, team members tend to listen to uh, other team members, what they think, what they believe, and what is appropriate. And this is from a study that was done uh, very recently, 2020, uh, involving about 156 drug courts in Florida. Um, drug court team members also listen to um, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, uh, SAMHSA, and uh, their state Supreme Courters, um, legal leaders. What they don't listen to is teams from um, other jurisdictions or individuals from other jurisdictions and uh, what uh, their experience has been. But what they hear sometimes is uh, very contradictory to uh, what we would think. Uh, we get very mixed messages. So what was reported in the same study was that uh, um, as for treatment providers, uh, approximately 40% of treatment providers uh, don't recommend or endorse or support the use of methadone as a medication-assisted treatment. Um, uh, less than 50% uh, support buprenorphine, another agonist medication, 
in the treatment of opiate use disorders. There's even a perception out there um, that uh, less than 50% of drug court team members believe that National Association of Drug Court Professionals support the use of medication-assisted treatment for OUD. And there's a clear preference uh, for medication-assisted treatment when uh, such treatment is available. Uh, first choice is naltrexone, the antagonist that uh, Dr. Westreich talked about, then buprenorphine, and then finally methadone. So how do we change these messages? And I would suggest to you that there are three primary focuses or approaches that we should take. Number one is the legal approach. Number two is what is the standard of care out there? What does the science tell us? And number three is following the money. What is available out there monetarily and what disincentives are there if we do not uh, use medication assisted treatment as one of the possible available treatments for addressing the opiate problem. So let's start out with uh, the legal issue. Um, when a judge makes a determination um, that there'll be a blanket prohibition against medication assisted treatment and will not be considered as one of the alternatives in uh, sentencing as a condition of probation or as a condition of drug court participation. It's called categorical sentencing. And categorical sentencing is a violation of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment uh, Due Process Clause of the United States Constitution. Judges are supposed to make decisions based upon the individual in front of them. And if a treatment provider uh, assessed an individual and believed that medication-assisted treatment of some form was appropriate for this individual's opiate use disorder, then the court would be violating constitutional strictures if the judge, he or she, did not consider that as an alternative. Americans with Disability Act, there is no doubt that an individual with a substance use disorder is an individual with a disability. Their, their use of the drug impacts their daily activity. And to prohibit that individual access to medication-assisted treatment, where it's properly prescribed or directed by a treatment provider, is denying that individual access to treatment based upon a disability and thus is discriminatory. Two cases recently found that was exactly the issue. Uh, both Pesque versus Coppinger, a district court case, a federal district court out of Massachusetts and Arasuk County, a case out of the federal district court in Maine, um, which was affirmed by the First Circuit, held that to deny an individual access to medication-assisted treatment uh, while they were in jail was a violation of the Americans with Disability Act. More recently, in uh, end of February 2021, uh, federal district court judge um, in Chicago uh, found that an individual was entitled to have access to methadone maintenance treatment while they were incarcerated in the DeKalb County Jail. 14th uh, Amendment and Cruel and Unusual Punishment under the 18th, under the 8th Amendment. Um, cruel and Unusual Punishment under the 8th Amendment applies to individuals um, that have been sentenced. Uh, the 14th Amendment 
due process clause uh, applies to uh, individuals that are incarcerated awaiting trial. And um, both um, Pesquet versus Coppinger and Smith versus Arizona County held that to deny somebody uh, the access to medication assisted treatment while incarcerated constituted um, cruel and unusual punishment in those circumstances. And it's not so much the withdrawal that would occur um, while they were incarcerated because they wouldn't have access to the medications. It is the probability of overdose upon release from the jail. In both cases, there was very strong um, evidence from uh, doctors that the chance that the individual would uh, relapse and overdose uh, from use of opiates was uh, multiples higher than an individual who had uh, access to medication assisted treatment while incarcerated. So those are three strong legal arguments why um, a court should not have any type of blanket restriction against medication assisted treatment. With regard to the standard of care, as early as 2002, the National Drug Court Institute had the position where therapeutically warranted inclusion of medication assisted treatment as part of the treatment regimen for opiate use disorder is recommended by NDCI and the National Association of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. The Board of Directors of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals in 2010 passed a unanimous resolution stating that drug courts should, number one, learn the facts about medication-assisted treatment. Number two, obtain medical uh, consultations, expert medical consultation regarding MAT, make fact-sensitive inquiries in each case to determine whether medication-assisted treatment is medically indicated or necessary for the participant. And finally, where there has been a decision either to use or not use MAT, make a record with regard to why it wasn't used or why uh, it was used in that particular case. The resolution was quite clear as well that drug courts should never have blanket prohibitions against medication assisted treatment. The authorities are numerous that have found that medication assisted treatment is standard of care in addressing opioid use disorders. From the AMA to the Department of Health and Human Services to the Surgeon General to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, all endorse it. With regard to the funding issue, several years ago, SAMHSA and the Bureau of Justice Assistance said that if you deny participants, drug court participants, access to medication assisted treatment, that you will not be eligible for continued funding or if you're applying for new grant funding itself. The only exceptions are where uh, the medication being used is really being abused. It's not being taken for a substance use disorder or the person hasn't been examined by a licensed clinician um, in prescribing it or ordering it. Um, furthermore, both SAMHSA and the Bureau of Justice Assistance said that mandatory cessation as a condition of graduation from drug court is not an approved practice and will also result in the denial of funding. So you cannot require that somebody titrate off their medication assisted um, treatment as a condition of graduation or advancement in the program. 
those type of decisions should be made and only be made between the treatment provider and the drug court participant. We're all familiar with the, um, the adage, um, fail to plan, plan to fail, or before anything else, preparation is the key to success. Um, the truth of the matter is if we're going to um, have medication assisted treatment as part of our program, um, it's not that we open the door and all of a sudden uh, medication assisted treatment is automatically part of our program. It requires a planning process. And NADCP and NDCI recommend that number one, you expand the team by adding a prescriber, uh, as well as a registered nurse. The supervision of individuals with medication assisted treatment requires smaller specialized caseloads. Similarly, case management is much more intensive, thus additional uh, requirement of reduced case loads. Case loads. Uh, you should vet your treatment providers. Um, NDCI, National Drug Court Institute, provides literally a questionnaire of various areas um, is um, a way of determining whether they um, really uh, will include medication-assisted treatment into uh, the tools that they might recommend to address the person's opiate use disorder. Um, finally, the sanctions and incentives have to be um, more flexible. There uh, should be no absolute um, final straw. Uh, this is the last chance. You have to be more flexible and look at uh, various alternatives. Well, you might say, well, wait a second. I mean, um, all this costs money. How are we supposed to do this? Well, both SAMHSA and BJA have expanded their uh, grant opportunities. And while there isn't a specific category, um, they do look favorably upon enhancement grants that include medication-assisted treatment. Additionally, um, uh, one thing that might be considered is a new program under the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which really uh, requires the drug court to partner with others in the community under the COSAP program, uh, which is a comprehensive uh, opiate stimulant and substance abuse program. Uh, and those type of grants are, are available as well. So, in summary, if you have a drug court policy that has a blanket prohibition against medication assisted treatment, uh, the two ways that that can be attacked is number one, uh, it's a constitutional violation. It's a violation of the Americans with Disability Act. Uh, so there's a huge legal problem with it. It clearly does not meet the standard of care and drug courts are based upon the standard of care, evidence-based practices. Um, where treatment not recommend and there's some type of diversion risk, uh, first of all, uh, you have to vet your treatment providers. Um, are they up with the science uh, that must look at medication-assisted treatment if you're dealing with a population that has opiate use disorders? Uh, and anywhere from 20 to 55% uh, of the drug courts um, have uh, opiate use disorders as uh, one of their primary drugs of abuse. Uh, with regard to diversion risk, uh, this is the whole idea of smaller specialized caseloads and more intensive uh, case management uh, to address the potential for diversion risk because there is um, a, a risk of diversion for the agonist medications, uh, methadone and buprenorphine. And then insufficient funding and lack of providers, uh, expanding the team, 
uh, trying to have both a provider and a nurse on the team uh, and funding um, make application to SAMHSA, BJA, there's funding um, under the Affordable Care Act, particularly where uh, for the 35 or so states um, that have expanded Medicaid. And at this point in time, I'll turn it over to um, Andrew Brown uh, from Ottawa County, Michigan, and he can address uh, what his team has done to incorporate medication assisted treatment. Thanks, Judge. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andy Brown. I am a program coordinator for the Ottawa County Recovery Court. We are located uh, in Michigan uh, in the little red box there. Uh, I've been in my position now for over 11 years as coordinator of our program. Uh, our recovery court actually opened in 2005, and we went through a process uh, starting in 2014 to incorporate MAT services into our recovery court uh, and essentially our the continuum of, of care that's available for our participants. And our process in doing that really actually opened the door uh, to MAT services throughout our county. And that's what I'll be talking about during this presentation. A little bit about our program as well. We're 100% grant funded. We have never received uh, not even a penny of local funding um, from our funding unit. So we've done all of this on grants, so it is possible. Um, one, to make it 17 years on grants and figure out how to incorporate and enhance services as you go along. And again, I'll discuss that a bit through this presentation and also through some of the Q&A um, later on. So from the perspective of, of a drug court coordinator and how you, and, and how I went about um, having to essentially make the cell to the team and, and get people on board, um, from, the, from a drug court coordinator, standpoint, and, and I believe there's a lot of overlap with any other um, position, if, if whether you're a drug court coordinator or a, a social worker at the jail or a court administrator, if you're the point person that has to make the cell to your constituents uh, to get this program going, um, a lot of this is all going to apply to you. Okay? So from my perspective, it's, you know, we got treatment providers we're working with, we got court leadership, um, probation and our other team members, which included our, our attorneys, and then medical providers. And it was needing to engage um, all of those constituents and be able to um, understand, anticipate, recognize the concerns and questions that they're going to have. And right, a, a therapist has very different training than a prosecutor. Uh, very different education, very different um, way of conceptualizing the, the people that we work with. And so you need to be able to tailor uh, the message to the people that, that you're talking with. Um, and the first way I, I started it was, you know, at the end of the day, MAT, it comes with challenges and it comes with opportunities. And you heard Larry talk about that in the program, uh, in his presentation. MAT is not a panacea. It's not a cure-all. It's not going to make um, an opioid use or alcohol use disorder just magically go away. But what is very clear is that the use of MAT is going to improve retention in treatment. It's going to help stabilize people. It's going to minimize cravings um, and other urges that can result in return to use. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you know, the different team members had different questions based on their concerns. And, and what I made an effort at doing was addressing uh, those concerns as honestly as possible. And at the end of the day, you know what you know and you know what you don't. But you've got to question what we know, right? Sometimes it might be biased or it's, it comes with stigma. And what's most important is do we know where to go to find answers? to the questions that we have? Uh, do we know where to go to validate 
our understanding of what we think we know about MAT? And, and are the answers that we're finding uh, supported by research? Okay. And back in 2014, um, this is still a little bit before the opioid crisis really blew up, there were no presentations like this um, at the time. Uh, there was no really consolidated place to go to get information on MAT. Even at our national drug court conferences, uh, it was an issue that was just starting to really kind of bubble up and, and, and come to the surface. Um, so having a webinar like this is just a fantastic starting point. And at the end of the presentation, there's going to be some uh, resources and links to publications from the National Drug Court Institute and SAMHSA uh, that you're going to be able to access and use. So some of what I encountered, um, and again, back in 2014, as we broached this conversation with the team, is uh, there is just in general, there was resistance. Um, and some of it was legitimate, just flat out, like we're just not on board with it. And some of it was just, it was questions. What does it look like if we do this? What, how does it work if we do this? Um, what become the new operation, operating standards and, and processes and procedures that need to be in place? Um, so one of the things we really had to jump through was uh, one, educate ourselves about MAT. We all knew about methadone. Um, and we all knew about a stigma that was attached to, to methadone. Um, but we really didn't understand what buprenorphine was or naltrexone, uh, or, sorry, yeah, naltrexone. Um, so we need to do some education. We had some philosophical differences. You know, recovery is about abstinence. Um, we had a couple people that recovery needs to be about abstinence. It shouldn't be, medication shouldn't be an adjunct in that recovery. Um, so there's some philosophical issues, concerns that came up, um, you know, well, participants are just going to get the medication. They're going to abuse and divert it. Well, what do we do then? And, and one of the biggest issues we had was who's going to provide it? And at the time we started this conversation in 2014, we only had one provider in our county. Our county at the time was about 270,000 people that actually did any prescribing of medication-assisted treatment. And that particular doctor was through a local FQHC and only had 30 people um, uh, open uh, for doing MAT. So we really had to go in and, and do some relationship building. Okay. Uh, other concerns, you know, participants are just gonna show up at, at a treatment session and they're gonna be high or they're gonna be drowsy and nodding off. Um, Clearly, if they're on MAT, it doesn't work if they're feeling drowsy. Well, as Larry said, that becomes prescribing practices. If somebody has too high of a dose or there's something going on, there can be side effects to the medication, but it doesn't mean that the person's high. So there's misconceptions around that. How do we respond to positive drug tests for MAT? And then the big one that falls on my plate is how do we fund it? And again, there's a lot of grant funding for that. So as I started um, talking to uh, by different team members, I, I really tried to tailor the message to why we need, uh, why we have to onboard MAT and how we're gonna go about doing that and try to tailor that message to my audiences. So for the judges, prosecutor defense, my court administration, uh, they speak the legal language. And as you heard um, Judge Meyer talk about, um, there is clearly established case law now um, there's administrative rules in place that are tie barred to federal funding that say MAT must be made available to persons who are in drug courts. You cannot operate a drug court and not have MAT available or have a policy in place that says you cannot um, take MAT. Uh, the NADCP had uh, passed a board resolution, I believe that was back in 2010 or 2011, um, affirmatively supporting. Uh, the use of, of MAT. And back to grants, um, again, with us being 100% grant funded um, and several of those grants uh, currently and in the past being through SAMHSA and through uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, Drug Court Enhancement Grants, we had to make MAT available. And I, I did have a holdout on our team 
um, that was just adamantly against uh, MAT. And I just had to tell them they, they love drug court, but they were against MAT. And I said, do you want to continue having a drug court? And they said, well, yeah, then we've got to make MAT available because otherwise we are literally breaking the law and our grant rules, you know, if we don't. And hopefully you don't get to that point with, with your team conversations, but um, that could be, um, you know, a, a stick you need to poke some people with. Uh, with treatment providers, uh, what I found was, you know, people that were newer to the field, some of our uh, therapists who were newer to the field, much more open to the idea. Some of the therapists who had been working for a longer period of time, uh, a little bit more, you know, suspect uh, or discerning um, in what NAT was about. So, again, we talked about evidence-based practice. Um, we talked about the philosophy of, of recovery and, and what does that, that look like um, and the idea of, you know, multiple pathways to recovery and MAT being a medication that is an adjunct in supporting a person in recovery, whether that's needed for only a short period of time or a longer duration. But really understanding and, and, and talking about this idea of multiple pathways to recovery, not every person is the same. And the needs of every person are not the same. And particularly with people with opioid use disorders, as I'm sure you all know and working with those individuals uh, on the day-to-day, -day, um, come up with a number of complications and challenges to help helping somebody get stabilized, helping somebody get engaged in treatment, helping somebody overcome the cravings um, to use. Um, MAT assists with all of that. Um, what also helped with the, the treatment providers is that at, at the end of the day, making MAT available to drug court participants is a really sweet opportunity to the treatment providers and to the medical providers that are making it available because drug court provides such intensive oversight of the people who are in the program, right? We have frequent observed random drug testing. You have weekly to biweekly court review hearings. There's gonna be case management, um, access to recovery coaches, um, accountability to the treatment plan. So if somebody isn't showing up to treatment, or they didn't make their appointment with the doctor for their medication review, we can, uh, as a court, step in right from that contingency management perspective and apply a sanction uh, as needed, or give the person an attaboy for making all the appointments and being open with uh, the drug court staff about how they're doing on the medication, how they're feeling, what their needs are. Uh, and that becomes really important. Uh, medical providers. So as I mentioned, we only had one provider at the time, and we ended up going, um, and we we really had to knock on their door <laughs> quite a few times, probably five or six times before we could finally get a meeting with the doctor um, and the nurse practitioner uh, and and her staff. And we ended up having two or three meetings, and they were very productive. And we just had to start at, first with re, from a relationship building standpoint. Um, just getting to know each other, learning about our programs, um, figuring out what the needs were. Um, and the reluctance that we had from the medical provider is that the medical provider who pro, uh, is prescribing, um, like the buprenorphine uh, or whatever the MAT is, uh, that the prescribing of the MAT is tie barred to treatment and case management services. So you can't just get MAT without being involved in treatment. And one of the big issues that the clinic was having was um, their clients would not be making treatment sessions or they would not get treatment notes or treatment updates from the provider or the client would just stop going to treatment and coming back for future um, a subsequent follow-up visits. So that was a real concern and, and then they were really wondering because we're working with a particularly high risk population, how is this gonna work? Um, with our folks. This is just going to be that much more of a liability and burden on the medical provider. And again, this is where we were able to sell the advantages of partnering with the drug court program. And that was, again, we do the drug testing and we can share those results with you right away. Uh, we do the case management and the care and case coordination um, with our treatment providers. We would add you into that communication. Uh, we monitor the treatment and court engagement. 
Um, and again, the accountability to the treatment plan. Literally, our case manager and our court program is able to do all of that for you. And that was an incredibly strong sell. Um, and the doctor felt that way. And at the time, her ex license was limited to 30 people. And she went ahead and got a waiver to expand the number of clients she could take so she could take on um, uh, clients from our drug court program. Uh, she was that convinced it was going to work well. And it ultimately did. Okay. So, in talking with our probation uh, team, um, it, we had some resistance from one probation officer, um, and it was more just around the philosophical aspects of recovery. Um, and, and we really had to talk about that. Uh, but the other concern was supervision aspects. So somebody's on MAT, well, here's just another drug or another medication that can be diverted. Um, what do we do if there's a, a positive drug test result? Well, the, the bottom line is if somebody is taking methadone or buprenorphine, you're going to expect them to have a positive drug test for methadone or buprenorphine when you test them. Um, so we actually had to manage that. And we sort of reverses the logic of the probation officer that if they're, somebody's prescribed MAT and their test results come back negative, that's when you actually need to confront somebody. Um, and then changes to supervision. Uh, strategies. How do we handle the situations where we find out that medication is being diverted or they're not taking the medication uh, according to their uh, to their prescription? Uh, so we just had to work through some of that uh, with the probation officers, uh, the treatment providers, and the medical providers, uh, working as a team uh, to figure out how we would handle those scenarios. So fast forwarding um, seven years now, you know, what does it look like for us? And to date, uh, we've had uh, over 50 participants who have used some form of MAT, whether that was one dose or for an extended uh, duration. Uh, we've only had two known issues with diversion of MAT. Um, one of those instances was with methadone, and one of those instances was with uh, buprenorphine. Okay. What I can say is we still have far more issues with diversion of prescription and over-the-counter medication than we've had uh, with medication-assisted treatment. And the diversion of prescription medications, again, uh, if a benzodiazepine or stimulant uh, was prescribed. Okay. Um, our prescribers and treatment providers have really come to enjoy the partnership uh, with our drug court and the accountability. Uh, that we're able to provide. Again, that case coordination, that care coordination uh, is invaluable to them. And knowing that that person is in drug court and that that person is, has to follow up with treatment appointments, has to follow up with the medical appointments, uh, that is huge leverage uh, to the providers. Right? And funding um, has really proven to, to be a non-issue. Um, Medicaid and other public funding in Michigan is generally able to cover the majority of the costs of MAT and treatment services for our clients. And grant funding um, has helped us out. And we've been very fortunate to have um, two grants from SAMHSA that are uh, drug court enhancement grants and uh, have been able to direct those funds to cover the treatment services and treatment costs for uh, our participants. Okay. So some resources here, uh, the National Drug Court Institute, um, Judge Meyer, who spoke uh, before me, um, has uh, written and presented heavily on um, MAT and has some developed resources uh, on the site. Center for Court Innovation also has great resources. And that concludes my presentation, so I'll turn it back uh, to Maureen. Thank you so much, Andy and Larry and Bill. Uh, we have gotten some incredible questions uh, in the Q&A pod, which we aren't able to answer right now, but we will. The discussion group is going to follow this immediately. But you will see on the screen now several resources 
that we wanted to share with you that were mentioned. The first is that use of medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder in criminal justice settings. There's a fact sheet on considerations for implementing medication-assisted treatment in jail-based settings. Another fact sheet on considerations for implementing medication-assisted treatment in treatment court settings. Um, these resources are available for download. Uh, you can see a file transfer box that just popped up on your screen. Under each file name, you're going to click the file and it should turn blue. So you see right now, okay, they're starting to show up there. Uh, click the file, the, it turns blue, and then you can see a download button that turns a darker gray once you click on the name of the file. And once you click on that, it will download directly to your computer. So we'll give you a moment to do that. And you'll see also the, the fourth file on the file transfer pod is the webinar attendance certificate. And we just want to remind you that this is for personal portfolio use and not for CEU credits. We invite you to uh, register for the GAINS listserv to sign up. A link will be popping up. It's difficult to see. It's behind this box right now, but in a moment you'll be able to see that. We also invite you to stay online with us for the discussion group in the uh, chat box. You may not have seen it, but we've got wonderful questions about, about polysubstance use and varying roles of different drug court team members, clinical issues related to dosage and length of time on MAT, MAT with youth and adolescents, and a number of, of other issues. So please stay with us. Uh, you don't have to change the platform, just stay right on. And we will get to those questions uh, in just a few moments. We just want to make sure that those individuals who would like to download the files have time to do that. And I'm trying to move this box over here. Okay. Uh, you still have time if you would like to submit questions to the presenters in the Q&A pod. We will address as many of these questions as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at these prioritized questions. We have so many of these that are really, really good. Um, I'm going to start with, oh boy, I think some questions for, well, here's one. I think this would be for you, Larry. Uh, is medical marijuana now considered and a part of medication-assisted treatment. Uh, we know that a number of jurisdictions are legalizing marijuana. Where does this fit into this whole discussion about MAT? Uh, it's a good question. The short answer is no. Um, th there's no indication for uh, medical marijuana in the treatment of addiction at this point. There are some data that came out um, uh, maybe a year and a half ago suggesting that in those states where medical marijuana is available, um, opioid uh, uh, overdose deaths uh, decreased. That turned out to be not related to the medical marijuana. Um, so the short answer is no. The longer answer is um, I will rely on the data coming out in the future. And if there is some indication that's proven by randomized controlled studies that are replicated, um, I would recommend the use of uh, THC. But up to that, before that, I won't, and, and nobody does it. Thank you, Larry. And I think the second question is also really related to you or, or directed towards you. It says, is the manner in which methadone is administered, oops, I can't see now here. This chat box is blocking my vision. I had the same problem when to... I was presenting, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let me ask another question because I can't see the question in the Q&A pod right now. So I have a question. I have several questions. Um, for you, uh, Larry, I think we'll start with you. Why is this program so important for doctors? I mean, I think that Judge Meyer talked a little bit about how important it was for judicial staff and, you know, Andy talked about how important it was for his staff, but for doctors, why is this so important? The question is, why is MAT so important for doctors to know about? Yeah, why? I mean, the two reasons. The clinical reason is that it's highly effective and that um, if you're treating opioid use disorder, um, it's it's 
the gold standard for treatment. So, um, you know, if, if you are tasked with treating people with opioid use disorder, it's the, it's the clinical gold standard. The second reason is that since it's the clinical gold standard, it, it's um, beneath the minimum standard of care to not use it. So it would be malpractice not to at least offer someone who's got an opioid use disorder the use of MAT. So both clinically and medical legally, uh, physicians who are treating opioid use disorder need to have uh, the ability to use MAT. So thank you. Okay, now I can see some of these other uh, questions that are in the Q&A pod. Uh, is the manner in which methadone is administered in clinics where the patient must go every day, is that a significant downside of an otherwise effective medication? Yes, uh, the clinics themselves are sometimes the problem. I'm not blaming the clinicians, but the way the system is set up, often uh, people need to come in every day at the beginning, and sometimes it can be spread out to every week or sometimes every two weeks. Um, uh, so that that is a problem for someone who is one hopes getting back to either his or her uh, work or school um, to come in every day. Uh, the second thing is sometimes the clinics themselves can be foci for for uh, drug selling. So um, yeah, the, the manner of administration, which is procedural rather than because of the medication itself, can be a problem uh, with methadone. That's why buprenorphine. One of the main reasons buprenorphine is so much more effective, to my mind. Okay, and here's a question that I found extremely interesting, and I'm curious to hear your response. It says, I've recently witnessed a couple of my clients, both live in a residential recovery house, who decided to taper off of Suboxone with their physician's help, of course, and get the Vivitrol shot instead. What I'm witnessing is really interesting. On Suboxone, they were moody or quiet, agitated at times, and depressed. A few days on Vivitrol, and both have exhibited positive moods. They laugh all day. Uh, it's uncanny. Have you seen this before? It's honestly refreshing to see. Well, that it's speaks common. to that speaks to really what we're talking about today. That treatment needs to be uh, designated for that particular individual. So some people respond better to Vivitrol than they do to Suboxone. Um, I I haven't seen that across the board. I mean, some people um, react very poorly to Vivitrol to naltrexone, um, but I think. Clearly, you know, the clinician is saying that those two individuals do better with with uh, naltrexone and they're the ones who should get it. Um, but, but I think it speaks to what we're all talking about that treatment from a medical perspective is for an individual patient rather than for just a large demographic. Okay, thank you. I think, um, Bill, this might be for you. It says, my judge doesn't feel you're sober when you're on uh, MAT. I'm trained in MAT and can't convince her differently. How do I address this? And you might be muted, Bill. Um, th this is really a difficult question, and unfortunately, um, this questioner is not the only person in this position. Um, judges, um, unfortunately, uh, don't always keep up with the science nor the law. Um, as um, the case law develops, um, I, I think there's going to be a stronger and stronger pressures on judges um, to conform with the law. I know that uh, Dr. Doug Marlowe has kind of set out a process um, by which uh, you might uh, convince a judge to um, take a different look at medication-assisted treatment uh, from the beginnings of just uh, kind of informal discussions to the bringing on of uh, educations, bringing on a doctor, training the whole team, um, somebody like uh, Dr. Westrich would be wonderful if you could get somebody like that to talk to them. And then uh, the legal side of it. Um, there is a recent publication in um, the National uh, Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers on what uh, defense lawyers can do to um, trying to break the barrier of medication-assisted treatment in their courtrooms, um, that, which start out very much like I suggested, um, the education, suggestions um, to eventually 
uh, complaints against the uh, the judge for uh, not adhering to the law. Um, and that obviously is a course of last resort um, because it has the potential for uh, destroying your drug court. But also we're talking about people's lives here um, and something that the number of meta-analyses establishing um, that medication-assisted treatment is the gold standard for individuals who are appropriate is overwhelming. It's one of the most studied things um, in, in science. And to not look at that as one alternative, and I'm not saying mandate it for everybody, that's totally inappropriate, but one alternative for those that are appropriate is um, legally inappropriate and I think ethically inappropriate given the standard of care. Thank you. Um, and did anybody else want to comment on that as well, Andy or Larry? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm elaborating what Andy was talking about with education that he has clearly done with his unit. Um, I would say the same thing with educating a judge or a member of the legal profession is stepping back and looking at the philosophical issues. I mean, you know, saying someone's not sober when they're using buprenorphine is like saying, you know, someone who takes insulin for their diabetes is is uh, not doing the right thing. That he should just tough it out. Um, and uh, you know, we need to put these disorder, the substance use disorders, in the context of um, of medical disorders as they truly are, and say that if someone had hypertension, we would treat them with appropriate medication. If they have diabetes, we would treat them with appropriate medication for as long as they need it. Thank you, Larry. Um, Andy, we had several questions about uh, drug court team members, especially about peers. So I want to direct this one to you. How can sure. peers be effectively employed in drug courts? Yeah, so we actually were one of the first courts in the state of Michigan to um, <clears throat> employ peer recovery coaches. So that's something that we've learned over the years. And um, uh, first off, from a funding standpoint, how you can, can make it work, um, SAMHSA um, and the BJA strongly support the use of peer recovery coaches. And in fact, um, the first SAMHSA drug court enhancement grant we uh, received um, was used to fund our recovery coaches. Um, best investment we have ever made, hands down. So consider um, SAMHSA and BJA, uh, their enhancement grants that are released annually Generally, the applications are released January, February of every year as a potential source of funding for that. From a programmatic standpoint, um, going through a recovery coach training um, a program would be encouraged. An increasing number of states around the U.S. have a required certification process now for someone to become a recovery coach. Uh, it's usually... In Michigan, it's a 40-hour training program where you're going to learn ethics, boundaries, uh, the roles of the recovery coach, and how that differs from a case manager or even a sponsor in a traditional 12-step setting. So, uh, again, getting educated about the, the role and capacity in which a recovery coach serves uh, is, is very important. And then maintaining those boundaries uh, and the integrity of that position as you get that going in your program. Uh, for us, you know, it, it, when you onboard any type of new service, whether that's MAT or a recovery coach or a new treatment protocol, there's just, there's going to be a learning curve. There's going to be some bumps in the road. So the mindset of your team and the staff that you bring on board needs to be a beginner's mindset, a learner's mindset, and understand that we're going to be encountering new scenarios, um, just kind of new rules of engagement. And when you have those, um, sit down and process them as a group. Get your case manager, get your judge, you know, get your team members, uh, and talk about it and figure out what a solution is going to, to look like and make sure that that's a collaborative uh learning atmosphere in doing that. So those would be the suggestions that I have. Okay, well, here's a little bit of a related question, Andy. 
What's the most important thing that a caseworker can do to support a client on MAT? What we have found to be the, the most helpful, particularly in the early stages, um, when we get a, a high-risk, high-need client, particularly like in the first eight weeks or so of drug court, um, really uh, it, it, almost like daily check-ins with, um, uh, with our participants. What are you up to today? Where do you need to be? What do you need help with to get there? Uh, and, and really focusing on that stabilization and getting the person to treatment. So that is what we really focus on during the, uh, I would say it, it varies per participant, but you could probably say, you know, eight weeks or so, the, definitely those first eight weeks when that person is just re-entering the community and getting going in the program is forcing the relationship uh, with the participant and helping them get where, where they need to be and help them um, get stabilized. And I think for the drug court practitioners and the therapists that are on this call, um, anecdotally, you know, you probably know that um, it can be really tough to engage a person with an opiate use disorder um, early on, um, and particularly if the person is young in that age range of 19, 20, 21, 22, really any range between 18 to 25, retention um, in, in the program can be really challenging. So we do invest a lot of energy with our case manager and recovery coach with those um, younger individuals uh, early in the program. Thank you, Andy. You, know, you mentioned young adults, and I see that there's another question that's more clinically focused that I'm gonna direct to uh, Dr. Westrug. Is MAT recommended for teenagers who are addicted to opioids? So it kind of takes us into that youth and adolescence. And, um, I'll just ask you to comment on that. Uh, yes, if the person meets criteria for uh, an opioid use disorder, um, even for late adolescence, uh, the M MAT is this is the standard of care treatment. Um, but of course, you know you need to look at each adolescent as you look at each adult uh, uh, as as one person rather than as a member of a group. So you'd look at. The, the medical aspects of his or her drug use, you'd look at the risks he or she is facing, um, you'd look at the family support or lack thereof as far as deciding what treatment would be, uh, use, would be useful and productive. But certainly MAT can be prescribed for adolescents. I mean, no one's going out of the way to prescribe a 16-year-old who took a few Percocets, uh, a maintenance medication, um, but I think that uh, it needs to be top of mind for the clinician who's evaluating that person as one of the uh, arrows in the quiver. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question, I, I think this might be for you, Judge Meyer, but really anybody who wants to weigh in on this. It's a situation where a MA, uh, MAT uh, participant was sanctioned to jail where MAT was not an option. Um, so there was this question about whether or not you had any recommendations to address the, this break in treatment while the person was sanctioned to jail for a period of time and not able to access their medications, their MAT medications? Yeah, um, this is a uh, problem uh, which was addressed both in um, the Pesquet versus Coppinger case and um, in that Smith versus Arasook case, and then more recently in the Finnegan case, um, in DuPage uh, County, Illinois. And um, uh, the courts in the first two cases uh, said that the jails were mandated to provide the medication assisted treatment. Uh, but the record was made in those courts um, by evidence in front of the judge that there was a high probability um, that if the person was not provided the medications uh, and they had to detox in the jails that they would overdose uh, when they were released from jail. And um, courts both places said uh, Americans with Disability Act uh, applied as did the Eighth Amendment analysis. Uh, the DuPage County case uh, is 
uh, somewhat different because originally the federal district court judge there said, I'm not going to mandate it, but um, the way the opinion was written um, basically indicated that if the person wasn't provided, then I would step in, meaning the judge would step in and address the issue. And what occurred is the DuPage County Jail, uh, seven days after the uh, opinion by the judge who did not order that the individual um, get methadone while she was incarcerated for, I think, 40 or 60 days. Um, uh, the DuPage County Jail said, yes, we will provide her with methadone maintenance while she was in the jail. Uh, what I think um, is required is for each jurisdiction, um, their drug court to talk to their local um, jailers yeah. and see if medications are provided that would continue on their therapy um, and not interrupt it. It becomes particularly important, is my understanding, when you're dealing with uh, a pregnant woman who is on um, maintenance therapy, uh, either buprenorphine or um, methadone, because interruption of her medication-assisted treatment uh, can cause spontaneous abortions. And uh, Dr. Westray can talk more about that um, and has obviously the medical background that I don't have to be um, discussing that. Uh, so see if your uh, jails uh, provide it. Um, and if they don't provide it, then the judge should look at some other alternative if they feel that a uh, incarceration is appropriate. I might say also that the Department of Justice, uh, as it relates to federal jails, um, federal prisons, has sent out a letter uh, saying that we believe that it's a violation of um, the Americans with Disability Act uh, and other laws to not make this available uh, where somebody's coming in jail for at least a short period of time to not to continue the therapy. Thank you, Bill. I mean, uh, Andy, to get your perspective on this, when you were getting your recovery court up and running, uh, what strategies did, did you adopt to get jail staff and supervisors on board with the idea of MAT to try to avoid just the situation that Judge Meyer responded to? Yeah, so, you know, in our jurisdiction, that was actually, um, it, it, it was a challenge for us because um, it was not a service that was available in our jail. Um, it, uh, MAT did become available for um, inmates uh, who were pregnant, um, but otherwise, MAT it just it was not a service that was available in our jail. And uh, actually, last year, um, with the assistance of um, Maureen and her team at PRA, uh, we were able to. Um, write a grant, it's called the COSAP grant through the BJA. Um, and that's another, uh, I would just say, a really sweet opportunity um, for, for funding that can support um, uh, drug courts uh, or regular probation programs and uh, jail-based um, treatment programs. So we were able to prepare uh, a COSAP grant that was awarded um, in the fall, and we've just finished up our whole implementation process, and MAT is now available to all persons uh, in the jail. We have that program up and running now um, and staffed, and uh, that's a huge asset for us. But again, it's, uh, for us, it took time, and it took the right funding opportunity um, to be able to make it happen, and we did that through COSAP. What was the biggest barrier to, I mean, clearly you had the drug court in place, the recovery court, long before the jail began to offer MAT. What was the, the barrier in the jail? What were their concerns? You know, it, it comes down, it came down to staffing. Uh, it came down to funding. Um, and it, I would say those were the, the two big things, you know, staffing and funding, and then also, 
just the philosophical um, differences, just the general understanding of what addiction is. Um, literally conversations about, you know, addiction is not a moral failing. <laughs> um, so a lot of education and a lot of sit down conversations and then dispelling the stigma. Again, we talk about medication assisted treatment. Most people outside of the drug court or therapy setting don't really know what that is, but if you say methadone, they sure do. And then you say, well, medication assisted treatment, it's like methadone and it's like stigma, stigma, stigma. Um, so again, a lot of just sit down conversations, education, um, the use of medication and addiction is no different than the use of medication in mental health treatment or treatment of another type of physical illness. Um, it does not cure everything, but it is an important tool um, that can be used in helping somebody recover. And, and Judge Meyer, when you were still sitting on the bench in Denver, what type of relationship did you have with the jail in terms of offering MAT services? Um, luckily, I had a very good relationship with the jail. They were uh, early on a partner with the drug court, and therefore uh, they provided medication-assisted treatment. At that point in time, all we had was methadone. Um, I might say that uh, I was uninformed at the time and recommended that people titrate off before they graduated. Uh, some did, some didn't, but it was kind of a policy. That has long changed as uh, we've come uh, parallel with uh, what the science is and uh, the appropriate use of medication-assisted treatment. So it's been a learning process for all of us, uh, me included for sure, but we had a very good relationship with the jail um, they did already provide uh, methadone for um, uh, females that were pregnant with opiate use disorders um, and then also provided it for um, drug court participants that were remanded for one or two j days uh, for a infraction that warranted a uh, short jail sentence. Thank you. And I think this is also for you, Judge. Um, as we all know, housing, housing, housing is a huge issue uh, in the behavioral health world. And this uh, situation where you have an uh, opioid use disorder client who's in your drug court waiting for a residential bed uh, that would help them prevent overdose, but you're waiting and they don't have housing. And what other options other than putting them in jail do drug court teams have? Um, and if you so, can answer this, this is the million dollar question. Yeah, uh, so I can tell you what you can't do. Uh, and unfortunately, what a, a lot of drug courts do, and that is preventive detention. Um, and courts have um, uh, the best intentions of putting people in jail so they won't overdose, but you cannot do that without due process. Um, and therefore, if somebody is um, looking at a situation uh, where uh, you're worried about their overdosing, but yet you don't have uh, the district attorney willing to file a petition to revoke a, and a remand and a determination of probable cause, uh, then you have to look at other alternatives in the community. One of which we found uh, was fairly effective is um, uh, day treatment centers and having uh, the participants uh, be present in a day treatment center. Uh, one critical factor when working with people with opiate use disorders, uh, particularly individuals um, using medication assisted treatment is if they fail to appear, if they don't uh, respond to their probation officer, uh, the reaction by the court has to be immediate uh, because that's when um, the, you have the greatest risk of a potential overdose when they're completely off the radar. Uh, we didn't talk about this much, but uh, the importance of uh, education on naloxone, uh, particularly with family members, um, and obviously with the, the drug court staff and 
with the uh, drug court participants themselves um, to try and prevent this overdose. There is no easy answer to that question. Uh, just, um, I guess one of my pet peeves is, do not use your jails as preventive detention. They closed the drug court, the feds closed the drug court in Indiana uh, three years ago because of indefinite sentences uh, for drug court participants waiting for a bed to uh, become available uh, for treatment. Inappropriate, illegal, don't do it. So Andy, you probably have uh, encountered some similar types of situations in your recovery court. Do you have a, a day program to which you can direct your participants or how is it that you deal with these kinds of issues? And also uh, the naloxone issue and the judge is actually right. We didn't really talk about that, but do your participants, your drug court participants re receive training on the administration of naloxone and are they given naloxone and, or their families? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so we operate as a post-sentence drug court program. Um, so we're not working with people while they're on bond or anything like that. And the way our actual program is structured is um, our probate judge runs the drug court, not our criminal judges. So essentially we're, uh, our probate judge is running our program on behalf of the criminal judges. So what that means is Again, a, a defendant needs to be fully sentenced into the program by one of the criminal judges, and then that defendant is reassigned into our program, and we assume control of the case. So anybody that's coming into our program is immediately going to be released uh, into the community, and we try to sync our timing process up with them starting the program um, to be on that date of release uh, from jail. Uh, for their for their case. Uh, we do have transitional housing providers that are available. Um, we do, uh, all of our participants are assessed. Um, the first obviously with a clinical assessment determining level of care. And if that level of care recommendation is residential treatment, uh, then we get them into um, either a men's or a women's residential treatment provider that we have here in our community. If somebody's homeless um, or does not have stable housing, we connect them with one of um, the transitional housing providers that we have uh, in our community. Um, as far as like naloxone goes, anybody that comes into our program, uh, we work closely with a nonprofit uh, group called the Red Project, uh, and they work throughout West Michigan and they do um, overdose prevention training. So all of our participants are required to go to that overdose prevention training. We try to make that happen within the first 60 to 90 days. Um, and now actually with our COSAP grant that we have, um, all people before they are released from the jail um, to start their probation or on drug court will go through uh, the naloxone training in the jail. It's going to be taught by one of our recovery coaches uh, and then they'll be released from the jail with uh, a naloxone kit, uh, which is the ideal scenario. Um, so that's that's how we handle that. I, did I answer the question right, Maureen? Well, I don't know that there was a right answer, but you answered the question. <laughs> Um, you know, we've been working with a number of communities uh, across the country on, on various topics, and one of the issues that comes up, and not infrequently, is who in the community uh, is either encouraged or, I won't, I won't use the word obligated, but to carry naloxone in terms of criminal justice system professionals. And in some communities, all law enforcement officers carry it on their belt, but we have encountered some other jurisdictions where law enforcement officers are explicitly forbidden from carrying uh, naloxone, but where instead EMTs and other emergency first responders carry it. And, you know, what we've been told is that there's some, you know, liability issues that law enforcement don't carry it. Uh, I wondered, and I don't know to, to whom, I don't know if this would be the judge or you, Andy, and, and I don't know, Larry, if you would know about this. What are your thoughts about who in a community should have access to Narcan or naloxone? 
Well, for, from my perspective, I think everyone who, who has any possibility of coming upon a, an opioid overdose. So, uh, police officers, um, you know, I've seen some high schools which, who are training kids when they when they teach them uh, first aid and CPR to uh, use a naloxone kit. I mean, they're intranasal uh, kits, so you don't need to inject anything. Um, so. Uh, you know, I give them out to families of my patients who have opioid use disorders. Um, pharmacies in New York and New Jersey, at least, are able to give them without a, a prescription to anyone who asks for them. So, anyone who could possibly have an out, uh, uh, come upon an opioid overdose. I was in a court recently where one of the court officers told me they had been, uh, uh, you know, issued uh, naloxone kits, and in the first week, one of the court officers resuscitated a juror who had an opioid overdose in the uh, in the courtroom. And I think that's really illustrative of what we've all been talking about is you don't know uh, who in your um, sphere might be suffering from an opioid use disorder and might find themselves in, in crisis at any point during our work days, we may encounter somebody in, in crisis. Um, here's another question. I think this would be for you, Larry. It says, I know this webinar pertains to opioid use and medication assisted treatment. What options are available for those in the same programs, and I, I think that means drug court programs, who use different substances? And I would add, or poly substances. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, all the medications we've talked about today are for opioid use disorder only, so they really have no bearing on someone who's got a alcohol dependence or got a stimulant, the cocaine dependence or something like that. Um, so the other treatments are certainly available. Um, there are some medication treatments available for alcohol, but none, unfor unfortunately, for cocaine. Um, but I think the central point is that if someone has an opioid use disorder and another uh, substance use disorder, at least treating the opioid use disorder will, will take that out of the game. So. You know, if someone needs treatment for a different substance, that's fine. That should be delivered, but you wouldn't want to stop treating them for their opioid use disorder. And are there alternative or complementary treatments for the other substance use disorders? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, there's a whole, uh, you know, uh, panoply of, of treatments available. Um, it's just that medications uh, available are really only for um, alcohol and uh, and opioids. Uh, but all the other psychosocial treatments and relapse prevention treatments and motivational interviewing treatments are effective with the other um, substances also. Okay, and here's another one. Uh, I think this might also be for you, Larry. Says, I'm curious your thoughts about when each MAT should be used based on a participant's sobriety time. For example, I've had clients who have had six or more months of sobriety from opiates and have been prescribed Suboxone. Curious if that is an appropriate use of that medication or not. If so, why or why not? The team's recommendation was to look at Vivitrol as the participant was struggling with cravings and not actually using. Thank you for your time. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think in that case where someone has uh, six months of not using any opioid, um, I think Vivitrol should be strongly considered, but so should Suboxone and, and Methadone. You need to look at the, um, the use of the drug in the past. Has the person had multiple overdoses in the past? Um, is the person coming out of a restricted environment where they'll now have access to opioids? Um, what, is the, what is the patient's feeling about it? Does, does he or she uh, is he or she concerned about uh, uh, getting the injection every month? Is he or she concerned about maybe stigma attached to the uh, agonist? Um, and, and I think having that kind of a real um, engaged discussion with the patient is is helpful. Not only getting the right medication, but getting an alliance with that patient so they'll actually take it. So. I wouldn't rule out someone from getting an agonist after six months of not using, um, but I, I would think carefully about all the medications. Okay, thank you. And uh, so the individual who had entered that question, if you have a follow up, please enter it into the Q and A pod. If if you have some follow up question there, uh, here's a, another one which we hear so frequently as we travel around the country. We're in a very rural part of the country. Very few psychiatrists, none that I know of in my four county circuit. How do we use MAT in these circumstances where the nearest psychiatrist is 30 to 60 miles away? 
And yeah. I will throw that out to any and everybody. I have some views on that. I, I think that's a common issue. First of all, it doesn't have to be a psychiatrist. Any any doctor who's taken the eight hour course, uh, any licensed physician can prescribe this medication. Uh, but I think that I certainly have been in places where there are um, no uh, buprenorphine prescribers in a large area. Um, Luckily or unluckily, because of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, um, the use of telehealth is accepted for the first prescription of a maintenance medication. So, unlike you know a year and a half ago, um, a clinician can via telehealth do an assessment and then uh, prescribe uh, opioid medications. Um, it's not a great answer, but it's the best we can do in those places where there aren't enough buprenorphine prescribers. And either Bill or Andy, did you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, this is Andy. Um, you know, rural jurisdictions present challenges on just on a number of fronts. Um, I would say one thing that's been proven here during the pandemic is that telehealth works. So what can be coordinated for follow-up visits and such through telehealth can be a real asset uh, in the jurisdictions. Um, and then I guess from the, the standpoint of getting participants to treatment appointments, navigating those transportation barriers, uh, that is something that is supported through grants, um, through enhancement grants, um, whether it's BJA or SAMHSA. Um, you know, a position could be written in like a transportation coordinator uh, or something like that um, uh, to help um, to help with that. That's all I have. Okay, thanks, Andy. Bill, did you have those types of experiences in Denver? Um, so, not really, because it's a large metropolitan area. But what's interesting, if you take a look at that Matusau report, uh, the rural areas, uh, their blockages to medication assisted treatment really had more to do with. Uh, uh, availability uh, and uh, less to do with what I'll call uh, philosophical objections. While there were some philosophical objections in the rural areas, uh, they weren't as great as they were in the urban areas, which is something that uh, um, I was surprised about. Um, the rural areas, uh, when they have the funding and access, um, have used medication assisted treatment and uh, as the doors are opening, they're embracing it as well. Thanks, Bill. And, and here's a, a, a question, and maybe we refer to this as a philosophical question uh, or medical and we'll decide. Does MAT ever eventually strive for abstinence or only maintenance? Please discuss. Um, I'd be happy to take the start out with that one, at least as a clinician. Um, uh, with my patients, I strive for the best possible functioning in their lives, including in their families and in their work and in their education. So that that's my standard for what will be uh, considered success. So, um, and sometimes that entails uh, tapering off a maintenance medication over time because that's what the person uh, is engaged with and wants to do. And sometimes that entails staying on the medication for um, the, you know, for the long term. Um, so it's not that I'm striving for stopping the medication. I'm striving for getting my helping my patients get the best functioning possible. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Bill or Andy, would you like to weigh in on this? The only way I would weigh in is saying that is a treatment decision uh, between um, the physician and the, the client, and um, drug court judges should keep their nose out of those decisions other than to be informed. And this, this is Andy. Um, and echoing what Judge Meyer just said, um, and, and Larry, at, at the end of the day, the use of MAT is to help somebody attain a higher level of functioning and sustain, you know, and, and maintain that. Um, as a court, you know, it's very clear that a court cannot order somebody 
um, to go off uh, their MAT in order to graduate from drug court. Um, so that, that can't happen. We really need to stay out of that. Uh, again, it, it's a, a treatment and, and medical provider decision about the, um, the dosing and, and how long somebody is going to be on an AT. Okay, thanks, Sandy. Um, and you mentioned dosing, and we did get a question on dosing, so I'm going to refer this to Larry. What is the dosage for MAT? Because we have providers that feel like twice a day is appropriate and others who prescribe three times a day. And we don't have greater details. That's the, the, the yeah. extent of the question we have. Well, that's a good question. Um, with both buprenorphine and methadone, they may be dosed once a day as far as the pharmacology goes. But um, I have had many patients, and I've certainly read about this in the literature, who are uh, – it's very helpful to give the medication twice a day uh, because they feel comforted by that, because they feel stabilized. They have some way to feel like they're getting covered all day long. So, you know, the pharmacology is one thing, and having an engagement with your patient and knowing what will be helpful to him or her is another thing. So, the answer is it may be given once a day, but uh, two a day regimens sometimes make a lot of sense. And this person, and this person asked about three times a day that they had some providers that prescribe dosing three times a day. Is that within normal parameters? Yes, because there are some individuals who feel like if I take this medication eight hours, I will be covered and I won't have any concerns about using opioids. Um, and I could show them the pharmacology, but that's not particularly useful. Uh, what's useful for them is knowing that if they take this medication eight, eight, every eight hours, three times a day, they feel comfortable. So I go with what's most productive for the patient rather than what the pharmacology textbook would tell me. Okay, thank you, Larry. And hopefully that response is helpful for the participant who asked it. And here's another clinical question. So I'm gonna direct this to you, Larry, but if others wanna weigh in, please do. What about co co-occurring mental illness and antipsychotic medication? Can antipsychotics be included in MAT? Yes, absolutely. There's no contraindication to taking any of these medications along with an antipsychotic medication or any other psychiatric medication. Um, any prescribing clinician should know all the medications someone, someone's on just in case there's an idiosyncratic interaction, but um, there's no overall reason not to prescribe these to someone who's also getting psychiatric medications. Okay, thank you. Uh, did either Bill or Andy want to weigh in? I know it's a clinical question. It may not be in your lane. I'm going to stay away from that one and defer to Larry. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Wise, wise men. Okay, here's another question. Um, and I know that there are some differing opinions on that, not necessarily on this panel, but in the community. Does a person on MAT also have to be involved in treatment? I think they mean psychosocial treatment, or is just getting the medication okay? This is Andy. In, in Michigan, I know that um, I thought it was required by a federal requirement um, that goes with having an X license. So please correct me if I'm wrong, Larry, but my, my understanding has always been, at least in Michigan, um, if you're getting MAT, you need to be involved in um, outpatient behavioral health therapy uh, at the same time. Yeah, that's, that's and, exactly, yeah. That's yeah. exactly right. And, uh, that, oh, my God. No, go ahead, Larry. Sorry. Yeah, so you're absolutely right that that if someone is prescribing MAT, they need to have the ability also to uh, recommend or provide psychosocial treatment. Um, the data are very clear, though, that if it's a choice between uh, uh, just MAT and no treatment, uh, the patient is well served by just getting MAT. Um, as a clinician, I would say that MAT combined with psychosocial treatment is better. Um, but MAT alone is pretty good also. So in your practice or in even in a, uh, in a particular jurisdiction, if all you can provide is the medication, your patients will be a lot better off than if you say we can't prescribe this medication because we don't have psychosocial treatment to go with it. So yeah, to that, uh, from, from the drug court perspective, you know, from the drug court perspective, that's where drug courts are, are huge. Um, because we can coordinate that care and, and supervise um, that participant attendance uh, at treatment 
um, help them get the case management, and that's a huge win um, for, for the court and for the provider. Thank you, everybody. We have yeah, some additional have... questions, but we've run out of time, actually. Uh, it's 3 o'clock, so I wanted to thank our panelists, uh, Andy Brown and uh, Judge Meyer and Dr. Westreich for joining us for the webinar and the discussion group today. I want to thank all of the participants. I see that we still have over 550 people who stayed with us for the uh, discussion group, and we had uh, well more than that for the for the webinar. This is the first, we mentioned the first of a three-part series that as we send you the email with the slides, we'll send additional information about the other two webinar discussion groups uh, in this series. But I want to thank everybody for participating, uh, observing the webinar and putting questions in the Q&A pod for our presenters. I think that this a uh, large number of attendants really indicates how important an issue this is for all of us in the behavioral health field. And I want to thank everybody for participating. And I just want to say, please um, be safe and, and have a good afternoon. So thank you everybody for your participation. And thank you for our panelists today. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks everyone. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, Larry. Andy, pleasure to work with you. Yep, as usual. Thanks, guys.